Praise the name of the Lord. There's this passage in the New Testament, in the Gospels, records that Jesus was speaking to, spoke to a man who was who could not walk. He was lame. Um, and Jesus simply said, take up your bed and walk. Now, if we lived in 2018 and someone said to a lame man, get up and walk, man, USA Today, CNN, the Today Show would send out the whole crew They'd have controversy for the net because somebody offended. How can you say, get up and walk? Jesus didn't tell him how to do it. Jesus didn't even tell him he could do it. He just said, take up your bed and walk. Now, I know this is Jesus. I, I'm well aware of that. Amen. But no doubt, before the response happened... There's got to be somebody. <laughs> Come on. I don't want to be controversial, but it's probably Oprah Winfrey's great, 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 great grandmother that stood on the side and goes, oh, how rude. Just, just a joke, folks. I'm just saying. Some people trade and do commerce on scandal perceived. No doubt somebody in the audience said, how could he say that? Can't you see he can't? But Jesus knew that he could. And all that needed to happen for him, once it came out of Jesus' mouth, the healing and the way for him to walk was there. Because he's the way maker. But until he had faith, his faith didn't make it happen. His faith allowed it to become realized in his life. It was God and his powers, the words of Jesus, that made it happen. But if he would not have responded, if he would have sat there and said, how? If he would have listened to those around that were perhaps thinking, how rude? How insensitive. But there was faith engendered in that individual who said, I don't know how. I'm not even going to ask how. How's this going to happen? But he had trust. He put his trust in Jesus and he got up and he walked from that day forward. Amen. Now I bring that up because so often in an atmosphere of worship and praise in the presence of God that we feel right now. Amen? If at the beginning you thought, how's God going to make a way? What is God going to do? What, how, how can I do this? In the midst of this atmosphere, you, you're probably starting to have a little bit of, you know what, maybe I can. If I'll just trust in God. But you see, the minute that we leave this place, you're human brain, the one that likes to put puzzles together, the one that likes to figure out how stuff works, is going to start to immediately, how's this going to work? How's this going to happen? Amen. And Jesus is still the same God that was in here saying, I'll make a way. You just trust in me. Amen. I'll make a way. You say, you look at it and say, it's impossible. I don't see the way. Right. It's not there. God's going to make it. Amen. If you just trust him. Amen. Most of our walk with God is really about trust. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And I want to preach to you something today that I, it per, it may seem like it is disconnected, but for some reason I, I could not get away from this message last night. And as I'm praying in... Uh, in this service and feeling the, the wonderful presence, seeing God just move. We, we took our time and we allowed enough time for, 
for, for those that were ready to receive and then somebody else and then God began to move. And so God began to touch people's hearts and lives and encourage. I, I saw that in this place. And as I've observed that, and I'm thinking, Lord, not sure how this message really goes with this. So I pray and open my heart. Lord, do you want me to bring something else? Do you want us to just, just worship you today? What, you know, keep coming back to it, so you're going to get it. And I'm going to trust <laughs> the Lord, amen, that he has some purpose in this. He, he doesn't have some purpose, he has his purpose, amen. So um, we should probably give you an opportunity to give, and also um, after you give, our children have a children's church, so if our ushers would come, um, and we will uh, take that opportunity. We don't really have many announcements to do, to do to, any announcements to do today. We've got a week or so of, of quiet, amen. Praise the name. I'm going to go ahead and just have you got, you go ahead and just pass the, the, the bags through the congregation instead of people bringing it up here today. Um, children, as soon as you give in the offering, go ahead and go to Sunday school. <clears throat> and while we're doing that, just turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12, if you have your Bibles, verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land... <clears throat> And Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass, when he was close to entering Egypt, that he said to his wife Sarai, to, to Sarai his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Now that right there is wisdom for the ages. I'm, I'm thinking that's probably a good thing. Now, particularly with what Abraham is, a, Abraham is about to propose to his wife, he started <laughs> by telling her how beautiful she is. Amen. Now, this next part I don't recommend, but it happened. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you, that they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say that you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake. Isn't that interesting how we always want to tell people, this is really in your benefit. I mean, if I live... It's probably good for you. Just saying. Please say that you're my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, that I may live because of you. So it was then Abram uh, became, came to, eat to Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house and he treated Abram well for her sake. And had, he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, and male and female servants, female donkeys and camels, and it goes on. And as you read, you find that God revealed or, or it was observed uh, by this uh, Pharaoh that, that uh, it really was that they were really husband and wife. They were not just uh, brother and sister. <laughs> I want to preach to you today about the temptation to lie. The temptation to lie. It's a prevalent thing. As honest as you believe yourself to be, and I believe myself to be an honest person, I have found myself saying things and I'm like, oh, wait a minute, why did I say that? That was... Maybe by omission or mistake and you have to correct it. There's a pervasive temptation to lie in this world. Gary King writes, Truth and honesty are the oldest and most powerful of all the human values and currently appears to be the least practiced. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray, God, that you would open our hearts and our minds. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would help us to embrace your word, Lord God, 
And Lord, identify dishonesty, Lord, in our lives, in our words, in our, the way we present ourselves, Lord God, and pursue your unadulterated truth in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. You can be seated. <laughs> I know some of you watch the news, some of you probably avoid it like the plague, but this week you might be aware of a controversy that swirled through social media and the the mass media. Um, An actor by the name of Jesse Smollett um, and his web of deceit that was eventually exposed this week. The week began with the news of him being attacked and targeted because of his race and sexual orientation. But as the investigators began to search for his attackers, they discovered that the whole thing was a giant lie and he had actually staged the whole thing. It was a complete fraud. Jesse had actually concocted the whole uh, scheme as a way to gain sympathy. He was unhappy with his salary on his television show and uh, wanted to gain attention, so he succumbed to the temptation Okay, that is pervasive. And we all have it, okay? I'm not trying to pick on him. I'm using him as an example. But he succumbed to the temptation to say things that were not true, and he completely fabricated a story that manipulated the public's general general prejudices and sympathies in order to advance his own agenda. Well, unfortunately for him, it didn't really work out so well. He was found out and he's now disgraced. And by the end of the week, his show announced he's being completely written out of the script. How's that for irony? I wonder what he thinks of his salary now. In the past... We've seen others lie and become disgraced. Uh, After winning a record seven Tour de France races uh, and becoming an American hero and icon and very, very rich, Lance Armstrong was accused of cheating. And after years of denials and public indignance, it was finally proven that it was true. Lance had cheated all those years and he wasn't the champion that everyone thought that he was. We've also unfortunately seen the people get away with lies. Who can forget the very public charade that played out on our television screens as football great O.J. Simpson was declared not guilty of murder, but then found responsible in a civil trial for the same thing. Many are the stories of even Christian leaders who have fallen to the temptation of being dishonest. Many can recall Jim Baker and the lies that were told on that, uh, in that uh, fiasco. Just this past week, I was told of a fairly unknown minister who dishonestly gained the confidence of their congregation and used his influence to exact their trust and their financial support. It's prevalent. It is pervasive. Every day, we all face as human beings the temptation to be dishonest. Where they're greats like Abraham, the father of the faithful, to the unknown preacher, to the, 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 the now disgraced and renowned Jesse Smollett, the temptation to be dishonest in order to gain something that we think we are, des- we are owed. It's there. These stories and even the passage that Abraham illustrate, lying is a huge temptation even for the righteous like Abraham. And I, I think that it's important for us as we, as we observe you know, sensational stories like, what, like this, this situation that happened in Chicago uh, this, the past few weeks. Uh, it, it, we, I think it's important for us to use that as a teaching point for ourselves, really, because we, we would tend to say, how can someone do that? And, and people are piling on and, they, and, and, they, and, and they're indignant. And I understand that. It, it, it is, it, it's particularly heinous, you know, what he, what, what he did. But we should be very careful to recognize that we all face the same temptation, just maybe not on a world stage. Amen. Exodus chapter 20, verse 16, we read in the 
Old Testament, as God is giving the law to the nation of Israel, he very simply says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. From the beginning to the end, God is communicating to his people, you need to be honest. You need to pursue that which is true. Amen. And we're going to delve into this a little bit because God makes telling the truth a primary focus of his law uh, to Moses by including it in what we now call the Ten Commandments. It's one of the big ten, right? It's what everything hinges on. You need to be honest. You cannot be a lying Christian. Those two don't go together. You cannot be someone who is in the, the, the realm of deceit and dishonesty and claim and, and, then, and then at the same time be in the presence of God because what we find, and we're going to get into this and, and delve into this before, there, these are two different worlds. God is the source of all universal truth. And there is no deceit and no dishonesty and no, uh, nothing dishonest or, or no lie in God. Amen. And as the people of God, as his light, as his representatives, amen, we, the people of God, are called upon to resist the temptation to lie. And we all have it. It's a strong temptation. Throughout the Bible, we see both a call to be honest, but we also see a depiction of those who will struggle with the temptation to lie. Lying is uh, characterized in various ways. We see Cain's evasive answer to God. Where's your brother? What, am I in charge of him? That's not the question I asked. If I was him, I, mean, I didn't ask that question. I said, where's your brother? You punk. But I'm not God, so that's probably a good thing. I'd have been, I'd have been, like, I'd have been on that. Like white on rice. <laughs> I'd have been all over that. But he, he's, it's, an evas- it's, a, it's an evasion. That's a form of lying. And it's also depicted in uh, Jacob's deliberate falsehood. We read in Genesis 27 where he is deliberately false, falsely. He, he, tells his, he tells his own blind father. He takes advantage of his disability. The ADA would have a heyday with that one. He takes advantage of his disability to say, I'm Esau. Well, you, you, you sound like Jacob, but you feel like, oh, no, it's me. I just have a cold. <laughs> Deliberate. I mean, this dude, I mean, he had, he, I don't know if he felt guilt or not, but, you know, somehow God had a plan for this dude. Gehazi, misrepresentation of his master in 2 Kings, the deception practiced by Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5, lying is a a sin of the Antichrist as described in 1 John chapter 2, and uh, habitual liars forfeit eternal salvation as recorded in Revelation 21. All throughout the Bible we see the the, the, the prohibition, don't be a, a liar. But we also see that it's a very common thing. From cover to cover, the Bible is very honest about both its heroes and its villains struggling with the very present temptation to fib. And yet we know that it's Satan who is the father of lies. Jesus said it in John chapter 8. Where does this come from? It comes from the devil. It comes from uh, the, the, the wicked one uh, g- telling us that we can protect ourselves. We'll get into, in, into the, the, the psychology of, of, of the lie here in a minute. But uh, the, that we can protect ourselves or we can protect others. He begins to lie to us that it's okay to lie because it's for the greater good. John chapter 8, verse 44, though Jesus says, You are of your father, the devil, and the desire of your father who you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. In other words, what Jesus is saying is that when lying is taking place, the devil is the one who, has, who, who, who is the originator of these things. We're succumbing to his work. We're participating in demonic activity when we become a liar. In other words, he is the chief liar. He's the best at it, and he's the originator of, originator of all deception. And when we lie, we are participating in the realm of wicked spirits. 
Amen. Now you say, oh, that's extreme, Pastor. I don't think it's all that extreme. Jesus said he is the father of it. So if, there is, if we have lying lips, we need to put it away from us. It is the work of the flesh. We need to say, no, I'm not going to do that. I am going to live honestly. And it's not just lying lips because it's the way that we live. It's the way we, that we present ourselves. It's what we do. It's how we, uh, how we uh, work in our world. Amen. So what is a lie? People want to people define things, right? Because people say, oh, well, that, this is a lie. That's not a lie. Well, let's talk about this. Essentially, a lie is a statement of what is known to be false with intent to deceive. It can be a statement or it can be a scenario. It can be a representation. It can be leading someone down a path without actually saying the wrong thing, but make it, causing them to, to, to believe something that you know isn't true. Amen. Amen. That which perpetuates a, per, perpetrates a fraud. We read about that in Leviticus chapter 6. Or, or secure a wrongful condemnation in Deuteronomy chapter 19. We, we read about these things. Le, Leviticus chapter 6 verse 2 says, If a person sins and commits a trespass against the Lord by lying to his neighbor about what was delivered to him for safekeeping, or about a pledge, or about a robbery, or if he has extorted from his neighbors, or if he has found uh, what was lost and lies concerning it and swears falsely in any of these things... That man may do in which he sins. Any of these things, it's a sin. Any kind of deception. Basically, any manipulate, manipulating the trust of others, whether directly or by implication, it's still a lie. Lies can be expressed in words. Proverbs chapter 6 uh, verse 19 says, A false witness who speaks lies. Lies can be very specific where you actually say something that's not true. Specifically, a lie is knowingly speaking an untruth. It's representing something knowingly inaccurate, and, and, and it's dishonest. And I suppose maybe an exception can be found, and we can get into the debates about uh, you know, uh, moralities and how they conflict if you're trying to save a life or, or you're, you're a spy for a country and all these kinds of things. And I'm not getting into any of those things. What I'm dealing with is here is I'm talking about in our life, in our world, we need to be honest and stop attempting to manipulate the truth. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Lies can be expressed in words. We know that for sure. A lie can be more than just words, but it can be representing a false persona or a way of life. Psalm chapter 62 verse 9 says, Surely men of low degree are a vapor. Men of high degree are a lie. If they are weighed in the scales, they are altogether lighter than vapor. What he's saying? He's saying, if, if someone uh, tries to portray themselves as something that they're not, yet when weighed in the balance, they don't measure up. Amen. How many... We've, we've all seen it. We've all seen people try to present themselves as something that, that they're not, right? Whether it's in the way that we dress or in the way that we talk. I've, I, 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 worked with, I, I worked with a guy. This, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be hateful, but uh, this, this, uh, this, this is a true story. He, he comes and, and I, I hired him to help me produce a, a, a job and so we're talking about someone who works for a day wage, okay? And I'm not, I'm not denigrating that, except, except that I, I know what the, the value of that is because I pay for that, <laughs> right? And as we're working, he starts talking about how much money he's made, and he's done this, and he's done that, and he's done this, and I've got this expertise, and I've got that expertise, and it just doesn't stop all day long. <laughs> I mean, I was exhausted at noon. <laughs> he, did, he did actually work. I, I, I will give him that. He, he, he worked awesome. But man, just, I mean, if you listen to this guy, he should be like, you know, richer than Jeff Bezos. And he, at one point during the day, he tells me that in the space of a week, I made $100,000. And I'm like, why are you working for me? Can I get a loan? 
Of course, I didn't say all these things. I'm just like, just, just get through the day. I just need him to paint. That's it. <laughs> oh, man. But ultimately, it's an individual that doesn't really feel all that good about themselves and their station in life, that trying to present themselves as something different, something bigger. Right? That, that's what it is. It's, it's, it, honestly, it's, it's kind of sad to be in that position. We'll get into that, but the, the, the truth of the matter is, is that we've all been around stuff, some, something of this to some degree, where someone and you're just like, come on, dude, you know, you know, I just, I'm really struggling, I, I want to believe you, but I just don't. Right? Because you, people present themselves, and, and sometimes we can't identify it. Sometimes people do pre, re, pre, represent themselves as something that they're not. How many times have, been, have we heard about people being swindled uh, uh, by, by, by scam artists? Right? But false representations of what we are, pretending to be more or even less than we are, what about those who find themselves, and I've seen this in the church quite a bit, false humility. Where people will say things like, well, I'm really not, you know, I'm really not qualified to do this. I'm just going to do my best. It's false humility. Because what it is, is it's a, it's a fish for a compliment. We've all seen it. Like, oh, I'm just nothing. I'm just, you know, just the humble little church mouse over here. No, you're a child of God. Now, don't go bragging and telling everybody how awesome you are, but just be who you are. You know, you don't get extra uh, heaven brownie points for, for telling everybody how pathetic you are. You know, I don't know why God saved me. I just don't even deserve it. You, you know what? We're all in the same boat, pal. None of us deserved it, okay? You don't get, you, you don't get extra, you know, you don't get an extra crown. You don't get, like, closer to Jesus in, you know, in heaven's courtyard. It, we're... None of us deserve this. Amen. But we've seen it, right? And, and, and it's, a, it's, an, it's an attempt to, to, to present something for, for, for a different aim. And false humility, I believe, can be considered a lie. Acting like we think we are nothing in order to gain favor or attention or some kind of sympathy. A lie can be technically or merely an error. Perhaps uh, it was in, uh, wasn't intentional, but when it's discovered, efforts need to be made to correct it. Being in business, I've found myself in that situation a number of times where I've said, said something and, and then uh, you, you crunch some numbers and you realize it's different. I've been in a situation where I'm off by just a few cents. And so I pick up the phone and I say, hey, I'm really sorry, but it's, gonna, it's, it's actually five cents more. Now that might seem minuscule but sometimes it's bigger you just you make a mistake but an effort has to be made to correct it you need to correct it because you need to be honest rather than trying to hide it so maybe nobody will notice right i'm going to deceive it because we're we're afraid and but the people of god should not be afraid we should be willing and trust you know i i'll i'll, I'll go so this far uh, in 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 business I, I i know what that feels like i know what it feels like to worry like here we are we've got a difference i've said one thing it's actually going to end up being something because you know some other factor or whatever and now i'm in a situation to where this could put this deal in jeopardy yeah it could and the, 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 the initial fear is like, but I, I work so hard for this and I, I, I need this income and I need this job to happen and I've got to do it, right? And, and so, so we're just going to, we're just going to, maybe they're, they're not going to even notice because I don't want to mess up the deal. What that comes from is that comes from an overall general fear that God is incapable of providing you either with favor with the current customer or another customer to make it up. Right. Maybe you do lose the deal. The deal of the century. There's other deals behind it because God's my provider. 
So I've got to put my trust in God and say, you know what, I'm not going to allow fear to push me into dishonesty. I'm going to face up to it. And I've even been in that situation where I've, 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 I've laid it before the customer and I've said, I've said, look, here it is. I made a mistake. It's not what it was. If you don't, if, if, if that makes you decide to, to decline the contract, there's, there's no obligation. And then when you're sitting there in the silence and you're really hoping they will have grace. <laughs> oh God, I don't want to have this conversation with my boss. Amen. I've never lost a deal to that. But I can tell you, I would have lost my integrity and my reputation if I'd have tried to just pass it off. Amen. But we have to have confidence in God. God's my provider. Amen. God's going to protect me. God's going to be my supplier. And so the, it always is the case that when we try to cover up something, it's going to be worse. Right. Amen. So you might as well deal with the fear and the trust issues that we have that push us into the deceit before it gets worse. Amen. And we go to God and we put our trust in Him. Pretending to be more or less than we are is, is dishonest. Uh, uh, in any effort to suppress the truth or per perpetuate a lie is still lying. Romans chapter 1 uh, des describes a scenario where the ungodly um, allow created things to ele be elevated above God. They believe a lie They believe, and they begin to worship the creature rather than the Creator. That in itself is a lie. To put anything above God and, and any, anyone in that system that begins to put anything above God is, is, is participating in such a terrible lie. And this is what he's, he's talking about, those that, become de, that, that allow themselves to be deceived and, de, and become deceivers themselves. And we see this scenario happening today in many areas of life as our world largely denies the authority of God and it elevates man and even elevates animals to the level of being revered above all else. <laughs> Amen. Worship of God is denied in, 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 a, in, a, in a secularized culture, but worshiping of the body and worshiping of pop culture heroes and worshiping of animals is commonplace. Newser reports Houston native Yasmin Ellaby vowed that she'd marry herself if she hadn't found true love by 40. And on her 40th birthday, that's exactly what she did. This well-traveled businesswoman who works overseas in the oil industry organized an elaborate wedding, reports the Houston Chronicle, which included ten bridesmaids and was officiated by her minister sister. Let that sink in for a minute. It was a spiritual service. It was not legal to marry. It's not legal to marry oneself, thankfully, yet, I suppose. But Ellaby's mother walked her down the aisle, and Ellaby sang R. Kelly's I Believe I Can Fly. <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> And so she creates this scenario and she marries herself. I read one other article and this one just, this, this, this one, someone vowed to marry herself and then she cheated on herself by having a boyfriend. I'm not, I'm not making it up. I'm not, I'm not trying to be a hater. I mean, but it's, it's deceit. Ten bridesmaids. Imagine getting that phone call. Hey, I'm going to marry myself. Will you, will you be there with me and stand up with me? You know how that conversation, those ten people, all they cared about was what color the dress was. <laughs> Surely someone in her world said, no. That's crazy. I mean, I'm not saying you're crazy. <laughs> Yet... <laughs> I'm just saying the idea, the concept, you know. No, is she crazy? Probably not. She's, not in, she's probably not insane. She's just believing a lie. She's allowing, and, and people are perpetuating, oh yeah, that's, that's great, that's, that's, you know, shows the empowerment, all this kind of stuff. No, 
A Mennonite woman from Harrisburg was, uh, has become uh, the first person to legally wed to their pet cat after a Pennsylvania court struck down the law that prevented such arrangements as unconstitutional. Not joking. <laughs> Anna Hostetler, 43, married her six-year-old Russian blue uh, named Boris Katloff in a small ceremony. <laughs> In a small ceremony at the local Mennonite church on Sunday. Once I turned 40, the church gave me a choice, said Hotstetler. Uh, either get married or become a missionary, and I'm happy with my decision. It was precisely these limited options given to her by the church that caused Hotstetler to fight so hard for the right to marry her cat. The church told me I had to get married, so I said, fine. And I showed up with Boris here, said Hotstetler. I'm happy to say that the ceremony went off without a hitch, other than the 15 minutes Boris spent purring and rubbing up against the minister's legs. <laughs> Even in a wedding ceremony, those cats have a mind of their own, don't they? <laughs> Paul, pr Paul predicted it. <laughs> Amen. Paul said, there's coming a day when people are going to love the creature more than they love the creator. And he wasn't just talking about images like the, you know, the old Egyptian images where they worshipped this uh, you know, cow and cat and things like that. Now it's, the, it's not only just worshipping an image, it's marrying yourself. Lifting yourself above the laws of God. Lifting an animal above the ways of the Lord. It, I know that these things are absurd, and they, they certainly are. They, these are, you know, sensational stories. This isn't something that's happening on a regular basis, thank God. These are sensational. These, these are the outliers. I, I get that. I'm not trying to hold these up as something that is commonplace. Even in a mix, as mixed up as our world is, you know, seven, I don't know, I'm just guessing maybe 70% of people in your neighborhood are going to agree with you. Yeah, that's kind of crazy. I hope. I don't know your neighborhoods all. <laughs> I know they're sensational, but they're absurd. But there's ex these are examples of the idiocy of allowing dishonesty to creep into our lives because that's really where it begins. When we begin to allow dishonesty instead of standing up and saying, no, I'm going to live the truth. And we need to resist this slow creep Amen. Into our lives. Because we all face it. Every single one of us. Why do people lie? Well, uh, it, 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 here's an article in, in, uh, on lying by everyone, Everyday Health. Um, you can read it on everydayhealth.com. It presents some common reasons. I think that there's uh, some very real validity to it. People lie for self-defense. Many people lie because they want to protect themselves from an unpleasant situation or conflict. Think of a young child who will lie. They, they, they lie to make sure that they don't get into trouble. Children lie to avoid unpleasant consequences or punishments. But adults do the same. It's really not much different. We lie to spare feelings. Some people uh, who lie often uh, do so with good intentions. They, uh, I mean... Good, I guess good intentions. I mean, Abraham said, look, uh, uh, you, you want me to, to live, I want to live, but you're going to want me to live too because I'm going to be better to you than that dude if we ever get out of this. <laughs> so tell them that we're just brother and sister, right? And so there's this, this, this uh, desire to uh, maybe spare, spare feelings or to protect feelings. A, a husband may lie to spare his wife's feelings for, uh, or a father may lie to avoid his child's tears. Uh, perhaps you've found yourself tempted to say, yes, dear, that dress looks great on you. When it didn't. I'm not going to get deep into that. I'm just going to say, <laughs> praise the Lord. Be careful about the door you open. Find a way to be diplomatically truthful. Amen. And if you struggle with that, then pray.
because God is a way maker. Amen. Amen. Hey, do we believe it or not? <laughs> Amen. We lie to protect feelings. Some people uh, lie to protect their feelings. We, um, some people lie to protect other people's feelings. Some people lie to protect their own feelings. Many people lie to protect their own feelings of self-esteem or self-confidence, right? I didn't want that job anyway, right, when we didn't get the job that we really wanted, right? Or when the girlfriend dumps you and you say, well, I, you just beat me to the punch, I was going to dump you. Right? Because we're lying to protect our own emotional state. A child yells, I hate you! May be trying to protect himself from the feelings or of hurt or reject others before they're being rejected. Or might lie to keep a secret. When thinking of lies that are concocted to keep a secret, one must only think of birthdays or Christmas. Right? So that temptation to lie is ever present in our lives. We lie to present a good image. Many people want to present a good image often uh, for work-related reasons. Think of a job interview where a person might dress uh, well in an attempt to impress the interviewer in order to land the job. Now, I'm not telling you you should dress down for an interview. You should dress what is appropriate for the job. Also, read the fine print, by the way. If it says, show up in a button-down shirt and jeans, don't show up in a suit. Because guess what? They're going to say, oh, this guy doesn't know how to read directions. Click. <laughs> I, no joke, I just, I just yesterday watched a YouTube video, someone talking about hire, hiring practices, and they, will, and they will put something very specific in the, in, in the, in the ad and, and identify... Um, a couple of things that, that I want you to do this and everyone who submits an application that does not do this they don't even look at it right that's just a freebie but we're talking about are we being honest in our presentation we need to be honest People who lie for image reasons often do so because they want to gloss over a blemish in their work history or avoid providing the real reasons for termination of employment from a previous job. We lie to be liked. Everyone wants to be liked and being part of the group is important as well as part of human nature. Many people lie simply to be accepted by others. Peter faced this. When, he, when, when Jesus was on trial and they said, hey, you're with him. And no, I don't even know the dude. Cock-a-doodle-doo. Right? Because fear gripped him. He wanted to be accepted. He wanted to just slide under the radar. He was worried about being arrested himself. So we lie to be liked, we lie to manipulate others, we learn very quickly that we can manipulate other people, whether we choose to do so uh, might be a subject of debate, but the fact remains that many people lie to get other people to do what they want them to do, and people who lie to manipulate a situation or other people are often only interested in personal gain and fail to consider other people's feelings most of the time. Whatever the reason is, and these are all, you know, all come with psychological undertones, right? The, the way we think, the way we, we operate, the way we need to feel about ourselves. Whatever the reasons, we need to remind ourselves when that temptation to lie comes, that a lie manipulates a situation and a person's thoughts, even a lie that is told with innocent intentions, what we say and what we do has an effect on others, and even well-intentioned lies are a form of manipulation. 
And so what do we do? If we know that lies come from the devil and we know that we will wrestle with the temptation to lie because we are human and we, uh, and we have this, 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 this natural need, what do we do? I will say that we need to stand upon truth and we need to stand with truth and we need to hold ourselves accountable to be truthful and honest in all of our ways. We need to depend upon the Holy Spirit. Why do you think God gives us the Holy Spirit? It's to become witnesses and it's to overcome the flesh and it's to live a life that we could not normally live without His Spirit. Colossians chapter 3 verse 8 says, But and now you yourselves are to put off these. Put off anger. Put off wrath. Put off malice. Put off blasphemy. Put off filthy language out of your mouth. Put off lying to one another. Since you have put off the old man and his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. You're not always going to naturally desire to tell the truth because your flesh is going to be tempted to protect yourself or protect somebody else. And so you rely upon the Word of God and you hold yourself accountable to the spiritual discipline of being truthful in the things that you say, correcting mistakes when they come out of your mouth, correcting, uh, uh, cre- cre- apologizing if necessary. Church, we need to be people of truth. Not only are we to be people of truth of the Word of God, but we need to be faithfully, uh, be pursuing honesty in all our ways. The Scripture tells us that uh, that, that the truth will set us free. We need to not be afraid of the truth. I'll even say this, I have seen Christians, I have seen churches try to manipulate and control information, trying to manage a lie. Because they're scared of the scandal. That's not of God. That's someone who has not been to prayer. That's someone who has uh, allowed the enemy to come and steal their confidence in God. To to be afraid of allowing the truth to get out. When there's something that's wrong, we should not be trying to hide it. Unless, unless it's a situation where you're, where you're protecting an individual, but we should, you know, you're protecting someone's privacy. I'm not saying that we just become blabbermouths about everything. Right? We need to be honest. We need to pursue the truth. We need to be honest as people of God. Amen? Praise the Lord. I've seen even good intention, intended godly people. And I'm not trying to cause doubt because, I, because there, is, there is great faith in the church of God and there is great miraculous. But I've seen pe- I, I have seen people uh, just kind of gloss over the truth and, and just make it look like uh, maybe, maybe God did something that he didn't really do, but they're just going to make it, just, just going to kind of go with it. Maybe someone said I was healed of this and then they weren't healed. We're just going to gloss over that. No, look, we're not going to gloss over anything. We're not going to become uh, managers of, of deceit. We're going to become people who trust the, the realities of God. And when there's truth, there's truth. And when there's something that's, that, that, that's wrong, we're going we're to identify and we're going to allow God to be God rather than trying to manipulate everyone else's belief about God. Amen. Praise God. I've seen people, good people, uh, face the temptation to tell someone, oh, you, you received the Holy Spirit uh, when they hadn't spoken in tongues. They'd only had stammering lips, but they, they wanted them to... Uh, no, if you didn't speak in tongues, you did not receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You need to continue to pray until you are fully endued with power from God. Amen. Good intention churches have tried to say that they could teach someone how to receive the Spirit. No, you cannot be taught to speak in tongues. It comes from God. It's the unction of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Stop being afraid. Even the good people of God sometimes for a good purpose are tempted to fall prey. And the devil don't care. He is laughing himself all the way back to hell with your soul in his back pocket. Amen. And once he gets it there, he throws it to the back corner and doesn't care if he ever sees it again. We 
We can't be afraid. Amen. We can't be afraid. We can't allow uh, fear to grip our hearts, whether it's for us or whether it's for a greater purpose. Church, we need to be people of truth. We not, need to not only be people of the truth of the Word of God. We, we, as apostolics, we tend to pat ourselves on the back sometimes because we, we feel like we have a, a greater revelation. We, we know of the oneness of God in Jesus' name, baptism and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost and all of these things are powerful and we need them in our life. Amen. And I will stand and preach for it the rest of my, uh, my time uh, as, as a man of God or even when I'm not. Praise the Lord. But I, I, we need to not just be satisfied patting ourselves on the on the back because we believe what the truth is we need to be people of truth in our conduct and in our actions and we need to prove by our daily lives and the way that we conduct ourselves that there really is an operation of the holy ghost in our life because if you come to an altar and you speak in tongues, but you go out and you are deceitful and you lie, you do not have the Spirit of God. God has not transformed your life. You need to bring yourself back to the altar and begin to pray until God transforms your life and makes you an honest man and an honest woman. Because God wants to do a miraculous work in our lives. Not just bring us into compliance with a body of belief. God. And so what do we do? We pursue the truth. Amen. Anytime something dishonest comes out of our comes out of our mouth, we correct it and we change it and we pursue it. We repent of it. You say, what if it's a situation and I can't fix it? If you can't fix it, that's where God comes in. That's where repentance comes in. Because you lay it before the Lord and say, God, I don't know how to fix this. I can't fix this. I, I've just got to, I, I, don't, you know, I don't even have access to that person to be able to, 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 to correct the mistake. God, I'm trusting you. God, put truth in my heart so that I don't make that mistake again. Amen. Because there are some, many situations where you can't fix. As a matter of fact, that's what salvation's all about. Amen. You can't fix yourself. You can't save yourself. Amen. When you violate God's law, you stand at the mercy of the, of the, of the one who gave it. And you stand and you ask for his forgiveness. That's grace. Amen. Praise the Lord. Church, we need to be people of truth. Truth comes from God. Psalm 119, verse 160 says, The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Amen. That's not just flowery language trying to prop God up as, man, we, you're the best, you're, you're the most amazing. No, it is a statement of fact. Because you see, God is the creator of all that is. He is the alpha and the omega. The minute it is said, it becomes truth because he is the only power of the universe. God is the full and complete authority. Any other kind of authority does not come from outside of God, but it, it comes as a direct uh, issuance of God. He is the originator of all truth because He is the Creator. Everything that God speaks is truth. And if He is in us, then we will abide in truth. John 17, verse 17, uh, we're told here, it says, Sanctify them by your truth. Jesus is actually praying. Uh, he's praying to the Father uh, for his disciples. And he's, he's saying, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself. And they also be sanctified by the truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify them. How are we sanctified? We're sanctified by His truth. Amen. When we come into the presence of God and we humble ourselves and we put our trust in Him, Amen, His Word comes into our lives. And we pursue truth because we want to be in the presence of God. And when we're Outside of the truth, we're not in the presence of God because God's holy nature will not have anything to do with something that is wicked. Right. And so we pursue the truth. And if we find ourselves in a mistake, we come to an altar of repentance and we pray and we know that God will forgive us. In praying for his disciples, Jesus prayed that they would be sanctified by his truth. 
And so it stands to reason that everyone that comes, everything that comes from us who are filled with His Spirit, it needs to be true. Because you see, honesty is not the best policy, but honesty is the only policy. It really is. Based on the people, reasons that people lie, it's clear to see that it's often prompted by fear. Fear of something, fear of the unknown, fear of acceptance, fear of uh, someone else's hurt feelings, fear of our own hurt feelings. Fear is a powerful emotion that can cause us to be, do pretty terrible things. It can, cause us to, it, can, it can freeze us to inaction. It can cause us to do terrible things. It can cause us to lie. Yet when we are in God, we have no reason to fear. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Jesus will satisfy our hearts and our minds and he will fill us with the confidence to live in truth and to live truthful lives. And when God is our strength and he is our source, we will not live in fear. And when we identify, when our identity is found with God, we will not feel the need to misrepresent ourselves because we will be confident that we are approved of God. And so you say, well, what can I do if I do identify that I struck? Maybe I have dealt with that temptation. It begins at the foot of the cross with Jesus bringing healing into our hearts so that we will not fear, so that we will not be dissatisfied with who we are. It's He who has made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and His the sheep of His pasture. We're told that we're made in the image of God. Amen. And so the only antidote to 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 all of this fear, the only antidote to anxiety, the only uh, antidote, to, uh, the the only real antidote to, uh, to to we talk a lot in our culture about uh, girls who who have uh, body image issues. The only antidote, truly, to that is to come into contact with our Savior and Creator, knowing that we are approved of God, not needing the approval of someone else or something else, knowing that God has made us. And our satisfaction and our image of ourselves, it comes from God. You'll only find that peace and that healing in the presence of God. Amen. And I don't say only as a way of it's kind of a last resort, (laughs) because it is a complete resort. It truly will bring the satisfaction of the soul and the healing that's needed so that we don't have to try to present ourselves as something that we're not. Amen. We sing that song. I'd like you to stand if our musicians would come. We're not going to sing this one, but it comes to mind that we sing that song, I Know Who I Am. I love that song. I know who I am. I know who I am. Amen. Because I am His, and He is mine. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. I don't have to wonder who I am. I don't have to wonder what... Uh, what what the, the, the purpose of life is, I, I know that in Him I have my being. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Church, having a relationship with God is the key to living in truth. And allowing God to be our constant source of approval and love will eliminate the need to manipulate situations and opinions of people around us. Choosing truth will help us to overcome fear and eliminate an open door for the enemy to have strongholds in our life. I'd like us to take a moment right now. I'd like everybody to bow their heads. Amen. Would you just take a moment to pray and examine, examine your heart? I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to pray, uh, 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 pray a group of people into, into tears and, and uh, you know, terrible place of repentance. I, I just want us to examine. I want us to say, Lord God, I want to be in your truth every day. God, I wanna, I'm going to make a pledge, Lord, to live my life honestly. 
Not to defraud my friend, my neighbor, my spouse, my, my, my co-workers, my children. Lord, not to let anything dishonest come from my lips, but Lord God, I'm going to... Lord, I'm going to determine to live honestly and truthfully in this life. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to open up these altars and I'm going to ask you if you would take the truth challenge. The truth challenge is put proposed by Gary King and he says... Take the challenge now and experience the power of truth. Here's how it works. Starting right now, for the next 24 hours, you decide to be honest and authentic in everything that you do. You don't lie to yourself. You don't lie to anyone else on any level of your life. You will start to become acutely aware of your thoughts and words about everything that you do and say. And once you get past the initial discomfort of being completely... completely honest, you start to feel a sensation of strength. A lightness and an energy and freedom arise. You'll notice a difference in your courage, the way that you walk, the way that you stand, the tone of your voice, the communication that you have with people that you love, the depth of connection with those close to you and with people that you don't even know. You see, what perhaps, I don't know this, this individual, but perhaps without even realizing it, he is tapped into a vein of truth to discover that when you live in the truth which is of God and you, re- you refuse to live in the world of deceit which is of the devil and you live in that world of truth strength and courage and confidence are found why is that? Why would, why would even people outside of a church setting discover that when you determine to live truthful, that you experience this confidence, this lightness, this energy? <laughs> Amen. Because you see, sometimes unwittingly, even people that don't have an understanding of God, they tap into these truths that God has established. Why would it be that this is the case? This is the case because God is truth. His word is truth. Amen. And so they're getting a glimpse of what it is, I believe, to be living with that freedom. That freedom that you and I can have today just by repentance, being filled with His Spirit, which prompts us and promotes our agenda. And it includes being truthful in all of our ways. So I wonder if you'd take that challenge. You maybe spend a little time here at the altar this afternoon. Would you speak the truth? Feelings might get hurt. I'm not saying to be crude. I'm not saying to be uh, to, to to be to, to lack tact. You can have tact and still be truthful. Amen. But to be completely honest. But the truth is, is that humans are not weak. You do people no favors by trying to protect them from the truth. And if you honor the people around you and be honest with them and you trust God, amen, he will come through every time. Amen. These altars are open. Would you come? Would you spend a little time with the Lord? Would you take this challenge? I'm going to be truthful.